Hello and welcome back to another historical video. This time it's about the Battle of Bastogne or the Siege of, Siege of Bastogne. Uh, Bastogne is a town in the Ardennes. Uh, it's the French name uh, actually. It's in French it's pronounced as Bastogne. And in Dutch, the other language of Belgium, it's called Bastenaken. And Bastogne became a pivotal point in the Battle of the Bulge. On the 17th of December, there was a meeting, and present were Walter Battle Smith, the Chief of Staff General, General Major John Whiteley, the British Head of Staff of Operational Planning, General Major Strong, Eisenhower's highest intelligence officer and they were discussing the German attack that we would become known as the Battle of the Bulge. At this meeting they looked at a large map of the Ardennes and Strong pointed towards Bastogne with a German ceremonial sword. This town must be held at all costs because all roads towards the Meuse River in the surroundings lead towards it. The 82nd and 101st Airborne, resting in Reims, in France, after their action in the Netherlands during Operation Market Garden, received orders to move to Bestown immediately. In the German attack on Bestown, Panzerleer was moving up to Bestown on the south side, along this road. And the 2nd Panzer Division was moving up on the north side along this road. It was left to the 26th Volksgrenadier Division to take the city. These units were under command of General der Panzertruppen Heinrich Freiherr von Lütwitz. The Germans had intercepted a message from the American military police about paratroopers on their way to Bastogne, so Ludwitz moves his Panzertruppen there as fast as possible. Because several high-ranking officers were either in England or in the United States, Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe gets command over the 101st Airborne. Quote, there has been a breakthrough and we have to get there, unquote. Men had been on leave and they were still tired from the drinking, having sex, gambling and fighting in bars. The 101st had shortages all over, especially in winter clothing. The 82nd was comparably okay. On the 18th of December, the paratroopers were brought to Verbomont, about 40 kilometers from Bastogne. They were brought there by truck, which was a rather unusual way for them to go into battle. Many of them had winter clothing, but some of them lacked a coat or paratrooper boots. One officer returning from a wedding in London entered Bastogne later in a ceremonial uniform. While on their way, McAuliffe received an order that the entire division was to be under his command and to move to Bastogne as soon as possible. The front guard of the truck column, however, wasn't aware of this and kept moving to Verbomont. In Bestown they found Troy Middleton's headquarters when dusk set in and both Middleton and Roberts from 10th Armored were there discussing the situation when McAuliffe arrived. Middleton ordered Roberts to send a team to Vardin, where I am right now, to try and hold this position against the advance of the 26th Volksgrenadier Division and the Panzerleer. This would be Team O'Hara. Another team was sent north in the direction of Noville. And Noville is to the north of Bizerie into this direction. The Panzerleer got delayed so heavily that walking foot soldiers arrived at the destination at the same time as the tanks and the mechanized units. This would turn out to be important for the way the Battle of Bastogne developed. While 705th Tank Hunter Battalion arrived in Bastogne, Team O'Hara occupied a hill south of Vardin, but there was no sight of, enemy Germans, of any German troops. 
But they did see soldiers though. Those were uh, the exhausted American soldiers from 28th Division who were making their way to Bestone after three days of heavy fighting. So, this is O'Hara setting up on a hill south of Warda. The team of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Cherry with the 3rd Armored, an infantry company, some engineers and a platoon from 19th Cavalry Squadron went from Bastogne to the east in the direction of Longvilly. So they were moving over this road. On their way there they met a wounded soldier who told them a scout unit of the Panzerleer was blocking the road in Margeret, the village between them and Longvilly. Cherry sent a small combat group to clear the road, but when this half-track with two sections arrived, they bumped into three German tanks and an infantry company, so they had to turn around. Cherry moved into the hamlet of Neffe, between Magerin and Mond, and wanted to set up headquarters inside an old castle he had seen when he first passed this settlement. So the Germans entered Magerin pretty quickly and in Wardan there was still no sign of them. On the 19th of December there was a meeting with Eisenhower, Omar Bradley and George Patton in Verdun. They discussed what had to be done and Eisenhower asked Patton how fast he could be in Bastogne and Patton replied on the 21st with three divisions 4th Armored, 26th and 80th. Eisenhower was afraid a hurried attack might fail and he ordered Patton to make sure he'd arrive on the 22nd. Bradley had a bad day. Not only was he suffering from various illnesses, but he was also witnessing Eisenhower going over his head commanding his subordinate, because Patton was officially a subordinate of Bradley. Eisenhower probably did this to show everybody that he could be a very good leader in the field too, because in the Battle of Normandy he had led the battle from a distance and he wasn't very much present at the front. So he wanted to work on his image and therefore kind of uh, did uh, this to Bradley to, uh, to buff his own image. The paratroopers who arrived first were the 501st Regiment Parachute Infantry of Colonel Julian Ewell. The Paris had seen the dirty infantry grunts, who had grown beards and looked at exhausted from all the fighting in the past days. They took parts of their equipment and even some weapons from the tired soldiers in order to supplement their own equipment. Ewell and his men marched towards the east to help Team Cherry. Cherry wasn't able to really set up headquarters in the in the chateau because the Germans were about to crush his troops. They would be cut off by the Germans who got stuck on a road in yet another traffic jam. Cherry, not being able to do anything about it, had to watch his troops get massacred by the Panzerleer who attacked with four tanks, among which was at least one Tiger II, an armored car, presumably a Puma, and 100 Panzer Grenadiers who were accompanying them. When they heard the battle noise, Ewell closed in on Neffe, and they started to dig foxholes when they heard enemy tanks coming in. Well, there's not a flag called Neffe on the map, we only have Mont, but Mont is in reality south east, uh, southwest of Neffe and there was a lot more fighting in Neffe than in Mont. So uh, I guess that this over here and those houses over there maybe 
they are supposed to be the hamlet of Neffe. And it was here that Colonel Ewell was digging in, in the foxholes. An example of which can be seen right here next to the river. In the meantime, the 2nd Battalion was involved in having f heavy fighting in Bizuri to the north. This little town soon er earned the nickname Misery because of the heavy losses on both sides. The Germans especially suffered, quote, painful losses, unquote, and they experienced this as painful because it was very late in the war and this whole action of the fighting in the Ardennes was Hitler's last great gamble, so he couldn't afford many losses because he couldn't replace them anymore. In the afternoon the 26th Volksgrenadiers and the 78th Grenadiers Regiment fought hard over both Magere and Bizori. Another part of the Panzerleer got hit hard at Neffe. Ewell retreated towards Bastogne to make a defensive perimeter about three kilometers east of the town. At least the Americans had been in Bastogne earlier than the Germans, who could now not take Bastogne by surprise anymore. There had been some sort of a race to Bastogne, because the paratroopers were coming from the south to Bastogne, and the Panzerleer was coming from the east in this direction. Uh, so the paratroopers had won this race and uh, now they would set up defenses in the town. During the defense of Bastogne several severe mistakes were made and one of them was about the medical unit which was close to Bastogne but outside the town uh, some 10 kilometers to the northwest into that direction. The unit was treating soldiers while masses of refugees passed them and one of the medical officers went to Bastogne to ask McAuliffe if it wouldn't be better to relocate to the city. But he replied, you can go back now captain, you're in a good spot. That night the German 2nd Division, who was moving into Bastogne from the north, as you might remember, attacked the medical unit, killed lots of wounded soldiers on stretchers and captured the medical unit together with its numerous supplies, like morphine. The 101st paratroopers in Bastogne suffered the most from this, as their wounded were now put into the basements of big buildings like stations, like that one over there, with inexperienced medics trying to treat them with a minimum of morphine. With the quick assault on Bastogne failed, the Germans now had to take the city in a different way. Both Bayer Line of the Panzalea and Cocotte of the 26th Volksgrenadiers thought it best to concentrate all forces to smash the defenders of Bestown, but General von Lütwitz of the 47th Panzer Corps had strict instructions to move past Bestown towards the Meuse River. On the 20th of December, Ludwitz entered the headquarters of the 26th Volksgrenadiers in Vardin. He said, Noville has fallen. Foy is about to. The enemy is on the run southwards, so after the taking of Foy, the second panzer will turn westwards and will drive into open land. Ludwitz also believed that Panzer Leer had conquered Marvi. Ludwitz later claimed he had ordered the 5th Panzer to attack Bastogne. But the question of Bastogne, should it be conquered or simply surpassed while driving for the Meuse River, was dealt with higher up. And the Führer headquarters had said that Bastogne was only child's play, and that the armies had to focus on the Meuse River instead. According to Cocotte, this was one of the biggest mistakes in the German effort to conquer Bastogne.
The orders for the next day were clear. The second Panzer and the Panzerleer had to attack westwards with the bulk of their troops. So only one Panzergrenadier regiment of Panzerleer together with the 26th Volksgrenadiers were the only troops to take the city of Bastogne. While the 26th division expressed its doubts about the feasibility of taking the town, Ludwig said that they should not worry. From prisoners of war they had received information which reaffirmed their opinion on the US troops in Bastogne, weak and not capable of putting up any real fight. Cocot was shocked by Ludwig's optimism. He had seen American vehicles move from Neff to Marvi. So they probably went over this road here. And apart from that, American artillery and MG fire could be heard through the fog. Around 1300 hours, 1 p.m., American artillery observers noticed a bunch of vehicles in front of a building of Wardin. So they directed fire onto it with devastating effect. Another attack in the Neffe sector by Panzerleer was averted by heavy concentrated fire from artillery in Bastogne where McAuliffe now had about 130 pieces of artillery in 11 different artillery battalions. Some of those battalions were of the 101st Airborne and others were stranded in Bastogne on the retreat when the Battle of the Bulge started. Among these units were two battalions of African American artillerymen. Soon they would run out of ammo and that would become a problem of course. M18 Hellcats caught two Panzergrenadier battalions in the open field over here, mowing them down with their Tracer MG bullets. In the evening, the Germans were closing the gap south of Bastogne, almost entirely surrounding the city. For the paratroopers, this was nothing out of the ordinary, as we can see from an account by Lewis Simpson, the courier of the company who came back after having been to battalion headquarters and upon his return the guy in the foxhole next to him said hey welcome back any news Simpson replied we are surrounded upon which the guy said any news on the 21st of December a German infiltration took place at the railroad to Bastogne between Bizori and Foy The Americans tried to push the Germans back but encountered well-hidden hideouts of the Germans. The Paris of the 506th Infantry Regiment, who escaped from Noville the day before, were sent in to root them out. Here's the railroad that goes to Bizouri. Some Volksgrenadiers panicked and ran away right into the arms of another American unit. Several prisoners were taken and they were sent to Bastogne. Bastogne had enough supplies when it came to food, even though the K rations were out on the third day. There was a lot of wet left in the town, so the soldiers ate many pancakes in the day after in the days after. McAuliffe was worried about the lack of artillery shells and fuel for the tanks and the tank hunters who were so vital for the defense. The weather prevented air droppings and on that day, the 21st, the German artillery started to pound the city. The fire was so accurate that some Americans started to believe there were fifth columnists among the civilians in the town who were directing the German fire onto them. McAuliffe had to relocate his headquarters into a basement. Because the 26th Volksgrenadier Division only had a Kampfgruppe left to deal with Bastogne, Bayerlein received order from Lütwitz to send a negotiator to broker a surrender under threat of total destruction of the city. 
this was pure bluff by the Germans because they wouldn't they would have a hard time to take the city with what they had and on Hitler's orders no extra troops would be reserved in the taking of the town the defensive perimeter wasn't solid by far so there were reserves who would serve as a stopgap whenever the Germans would break through somewhere these platoons went out into the fog and sometimes get fired at by their own troops upon return. The only reserve that was held in Bastogne itself was Team Snafu. Snafu meaning situation normal, all fucked up. This was a ragtag group of infantrymen, some even with fatigue, so these were of course no quality troops. They could be sent quickly over to places where it got hot and functioned as an emergency measure. Temperatures dropped even further now, it was freezing and more snow was coming. On Friday the 22nd of December, soldiers of the 327th Regiment Glider Infantry saw four Germans approach the town with a white flag. So they assumed that the, the Germans wanted to surrender. An English-speaking German said that on grounds on both the Geneva and the Hague Conventions they had the right to set an ultimatum. So they sent this letter to McAuliffe. To the USA commander of the encircled town of Beston. The fortune of war is changing. This time the USA forces in and near Beston have been encircled by strong German armored units. More German armored units have crossed the river Our near Orteville have taken Marche and reached Saint-Hubert by passing through Ombre, Cibre, Tille. Libramont is in German hands. There's only one possibility to, to save the encircled USA troops from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of the encircled town. In order to think it over, a term of two hours will be granted, beginning with the presentation of this note. If this proposal should be rejected, one German artillery corps and six heavy AA battalions are ready to annihilate the USA troops in and near Bestown. The order for firing will be given immediately after these two hours term. After this two hours term. All the serious civilian losses caused by this artillery fire would not correspond with the well-known American humanity. Signed the German commander. So this note uh, got to McAuliffe and uh, McAuliffe had been up all night. So he was doing a quick nap when he got woken by the chief of staff who told him that the Germans had sent envoys who were asking for an American surrender. McAuliffe replied, nuts. This answer got relayed to von Lütwitz in a formal letter which read, quote, to the German commander, nuts, the American commander. Ludwig received the anger of von Manteuffel, who thought this whole ultimatum thing was stupid bluff because the Germans didn't have enough ammo to follow up on their threat to pulverize Bestown with artillery if the ultimatum would not be met. On the other hand, McAuliffe couldn't know that the Germans were bluffing. Because of the snow, the uniforms of the Americans were very visible, so they asked the civilians for bedsheets which they then tore up and used as helmets and weapon covers. Some of them made poncho-like capes out of them, but they soon discovered these capes froze up when they were on patrol and they made noise while walking. The cold hurt the Paris of the 101st badly. The number of cases of frostbite and trench food rose dramatically. Several officers of the 101st got killed in their sleeping bags when German RT hit their uh, headquarter building and a planned airdrop had to be cancelled because of bad visibility. Despite all this, morale was high. Battlesmith told Strong, who had doubts about the defense of Bestown, that our best division is in Bestown and when the commander says they are okay, they are gonna hold. On the morning of the 23rd, the skies were clear. So P-47 Thunderbolts could search for enemy tanks in an air support role. George Patton de de decorated his chaplain O'Neill with the Bronze Star because, quote, he had prayed so damn well for good weather.
the Germans still believed that the Americans were trying to break out of the siege. So they reinforced their presence west of the town. Because Hitler refused to believe von Mantel's report that, that, that they didn't have enough troops to take Bestown, he had sent an officer to check the situation, but this officer fully agreed with von Manteuffel. Kokot's troops had bigger food shortage than the paratroopers in Bestown. The situation was so bad for them, they had to, quote, share half a bread with ten men, unquote. The Paris didn't have winter clothing, but the Volksgrenadiers were even worse off. So they looted boots and other pieces of equipment off of Americans fallen in battle. This meant they regularly got shot when they wanted to surrender because they looked like Americans dre dressed up as Americans. This was also uh, because of the special infiltration commando led by Otto Skorzeny who, or Skorzeny who were disguised as Americans trying to sabotage as much as possible behind the lines. Scorzini's troops never got very close to Bestown, and their mission of deception wasn't very successful overall, but the Americans in Bestown couldn't notice. Around noon the Germans attacked on the northwestern flank of the town. We can see this nice panther wreck over here, representing the attack in the on the northwestern corner of the town. Yeah, I won't be shot. Around the same time the Germans attacked on the northwestern flank of the town of Bestown, there was an attack on Marvi by the 901st Panzer Grenadier Division of the Panzer Leer. But further south, Patton's units were arriving. So the 5th Fallschirmjäger uh, unit was on the run to the north. They probably came over this road here. This resulted in another traffic jam, which got spotted by P-47s, which started attacking the columns of retreating soldiers, horse carts and vehicles. At the same time a huge supply drop was being carried out over Bestown, which led the Germans to believe paratroopers were dropping behind them. Cocotte brought the situation under control by ordering retreating units to turn around, block roads and prepare to fight. What they thought were Patton's troops had not been anything more than a forward reconnaissance unit who had retreated already because they didn't have the numbers to do anything. The supply drop at Bestown was a big success. The soldiers were cheering the planes, quote, like they were watching a game in the Super Bowl or the World Series, unquote. The parachutes were used as sleeping bags the bags in which the supplies were dropped were being cut to pieces by the men to wrap around their feet. The, 230 the 241 planes dropped 334 tons of ammo, fuel, rations and medical supplies, among which was blood, but, quote, the bottles broke on impact, or later, when a shell hit the storage house where they were put, unquote. So dropping blood was not a very good idea, idea uh, because it was a total failure to deliver it correctly. Nine planes missed the drop zone and seven planes got shot down. Cocotte complained that there were zero German planes present. There were some German fighters trying to attack the dropping, but the Allied fighters were far more numerous and chased off the Germans. As soon as the cargo planes had turned back, the 82 uh, the 82 Thunderbolts escorting them opened fire on ground targets, following tracks in the snow and firing rockets at the end of them, destroying even hidden tanks and also several artillery positions. After sunset and the departure of the planes, the attack on Marvi by the 901st Panzergrenadiers continued. Nebelwerfers were in support, as the German infantry advanced behind groups of four or five tanks. Defenders of Marvi fired flares, which made Panthers and soldiers visible. 
the 327th Glider Infantry and 326th Airborne Battalion Engineers opened fire with carbines NMGs. Some bazookas took out a few tanks, usually by destroying the tracks, stopping the tanks, but not disabling their dangerous wepo weaponry. A breakthrough to the road to Bastogne, which is over here, A breakthrough to the road to Bastogne was prevented at the last moment, when McAuliffe used his last reserve and ordered all artillery to keep firing and the intense artillery fire stopped the Germans in their tracks, so they could not break through over this road to Bastogne. Cocotte ended the attack and received order from von Manteuffel to attack Bastogne on Christmas Day. The 24th of December was another bright and clear day, so some airlifting could be done into Bastogne, among which were some much needed medical supplies. General Patton's advance went a lot slower than anticipated, so he kept shouting about his success to mask this a bit. He was being held back by the 5th Vosjemjäger south of Bastogne, not being able to break through to the town. It didn't help that the American engineers from the 8th Corps had blown everything in their path when they retreated to Bastogne. So 4th Armored got delayed more by their own colleagues than by the enemy. Morale was high among the troops in Bastogne, but cold and hunger were gnawing at the survivors. Many soldiers depended on the generosity of Belgian families, who shared what they had with the Americans. In Bastogne and north of the town, quote, the rations were increased by adding beef, rabbit and deer, when these animals tripped the mines. Snipers shot boar, but the taste for boar disappeared, after they were spotted eating the intestines of fallen soldiers. The cold meant that condoms were used to cover the sides of AT guns, and also the microphones of radios. Here these sides, they would be covered. Here the side, the sides over here. Um, so, yeah, microphones of radios also were covered by m uh, condoms to prevent them from freezing up. Fires were forbidden because they would reveal their position. And MG crews had to piss over the barrels of their 50 cals in order to let the mechanisms work correctly. Soldiers used hand grenades to make foxholes because the ground was so hard and temperatures dropped to somewhere around minus 17 degrees Celsius. Early morning of the 24th, the fight with the 901st Panzer Grenadiers around Marvi got more confused by the minute. Cases of friendly fire occurred because of the cha chaotic nature of the battle. The Germans drove the Americans out of Marvi itself, but they held on to the hill just west of it. McAuliffe's headquarters was checking the defenses, and the German advance from Marvi was blocked at the last moment but the west side of the perimeter had some weaknesses. The conclusion was to shorten the defensive perimeter around Bastogne, so it would automatically be reinforced because the troops had to watch over a much shorter defensive line. Von Manteuffel and von Ludwitz had persuaded Kokot that the best course of action would be to obliterate Bastogne the next day, before the 4th Armored would break through. On Christmas Eve, the Americans in Bastogne listened endlessly to White Christmas, which played on a civilian's radio, while the Germans sang Silent Night, Holy Night, Stille Nacht in German. Not only the Germans who were in the, their positions around the town, but also the German prisoners of war, who got a visit by McAuliffe. In Bastogne, some 100 soldiers gathered in the church for a mass with an improvised altar, which got illuminated by candles in empty ration cans. The chaplain gave his simple advice. Don't make any plans, for God's plan will prevail. 
the church of Bastown is here on the map. Of course, the perimeter had to be watched and several soldiers were in the foxholes around the town and those who were lucky got a visit from their officer who brought some bottled spirits for them. General Patton attended the mass in Luxembourg City where Chaplain Frederick MacDonald recognized him immediately standing tall at the back of the church. McDonald's, knowing Patton always wanted to be part of history, McDonald's went to him to tell him that during the First World War, Emperor Wilhelm II had attended Mass in this very church, and then asked, Would you like to sit in the Emperor's place, sir? Patton smiled and replied, Bring me to it. In the night of the 24th to the 25th, a Junkers 88 bombed Bastogne, which came as a shock because the Americans thought that the Luftwaffe was obsolete by this time. Moreover, the damage was huge. McAuliffe's headquarters got hit. But even worse, the first aid post was a three-story building and it had collapsed over the wounded inside and the pile of rubble it now was, was on fire. A nurse and about 25 heavily wounded soldiers had died, being burned alive in the rubble. Trying to extinguish the fire was of no use. Buckets of water had zero effect on the blazing building. Some soldiers being stuck begged their comrades to shoot them before they would be burned alive as well. The bombers were strafing the streets, making the extinguishing of the fire even harder. There was no AA in the town uh, and the uh, paratroopers returned fire with their hand weapons like this, shooting at the planes. There was no AA in the town because all the four-barreled 50 cals, the so-called meat choppers, were on the edge of the perimeter. So here we have a little historical inaccuracy because these should have been only on the edge of the perimeter, like the one we have seen on Marvi. In the early morning the German attack started. The bombing had been the prelude to it. At 5 o'clock in the morning the Germans started to advance and around 10 o'clock in the morning the 901st Panzergrenadiers had fought themselves away into the city in the southeast. In this sector probably. This is the southeast of Bestown in the map. A company of them reached the crossroads at the entrance of Bastown and a breakthrough seemed inevitable. Staff officers in McAuliffe's headquarters made themselves ready for battle and logistics personnel gathered spare bazookas for a fight to the death. Corporal Jackson of the 502nd Regiment Parachute Infantry took a bazooka and shot a Panzer IV with nine men on it. Four of them died or were knocked out by the explosion. The tank stopped and started to burn. When the crew and the rest of the guys tried to escape, they were mowed down. Shermans, Hellcats and P-47 Thunderbolts hammered the enemy. The planes dropped napalm and strafed with their 50 cals. The local farmhouses weren't spared in what the American commanders saw as a battle until the bitter end. In the southeast, the 901st Panzer Grenadiers of the Panzerleer was cut off and destroyed. The German regiment didn't have anyone left to reinforce them. Cocotte decided to not attack any further. The 15th Panzer Grenadiers division was all but wiped out. His own division had around 800 casualties. Most companies only had some 20 men left, about 10% of their original strength. One battalion, usually over 300 soldiers, was reduced to 40 men. The experienced officers and NCOs suffered the heaviest losses. An officer of the 26th Volksgrenadier Division complained, We were at 900 meters from the edge of Bastogne and we couldn't get into the city. This view must have looked something like this. 
Kokot reported that the strength of his troops was so low now that further attacks would be irresponsible. Von Ludwitz agreed and ordered the Germans to hold their position until the Führerbegleit Brigade would arrive in the next 48 hours. In the south, the 5th Fallschirmjäger Regiment could not hold against the 4th Armored Division of Patton any longer. So the only thing that could be done was to mine the roads to Beston and prepare AT positions. Cocotte concluded that the Battle of the Bulge was a failure, but Hitler's headquarters was not ready to acknowledge these facts. Amidst all this fighting, a surgeon with a stash of penicillin was brought into the town and a P-38 Lightning dropped maps and reconnaissance photographs. Patton's breakthrough had failed and McAuliffe believed that they were abandoned. On the 26th of December, Patton said to Bradley, the crowd stuck his head in a meat grinder and this time I've got the handle. Again, this was uh, a bit of boasting by Patton to mask his frustration about his advance being so slow. Patton had underestimated the weather, the terrain and the resilience of the Germans. The Germans had a lot more units in the area than anticipated, among which were the 352nd Volksgrenadier Division. The, this division was based on the unit who had killed so many Americans on Omaha Beach. At the same time, he had overestimated the abilities of his own troops. The 4th Armored, Patton's favorite unit, had damaged tanks, who weren't able to do well in the terrain. They slipped off the icy roads and bumped into each other because they couldn't break in time. Forests and deep valleys weren't all that great for tanks in the first place. The defenders in Bastogne could hear the 4th Armored fight, but they didn't keep their hopes up as they had been disappointed before. The clear sky of the day enabled another airdrop. A total of 320 tons of supplies, ammo, rations and cigarettes were dropped from the sky in Beston with parachutes and with gliders. One of the gliders carrying a medical unit with five surgeons for operating assistance and about 300 kilos of equipment was disconnected at, one at 100 meters in front of Beston, uh, disconnected from the towing C-47. It was about to make a perfect landing, but it kept on gliding over the snow into the direction of the German lines. When it finally stopped, the medical, uh, the medical unit got out of the glider and they ran back to the American lines while infantry rushed out to save the equipment. The surgeons started operating immediately beginning with the 150 worst cases and they operated all night long until noon on the 27th of December, checking on wounds which hadn't had any medical attention for over 8 days. This caused many amputations, but the surgeons managed to lose no more than 3 lives out of the 150 operated soldiers. At 1400 hours, Patton received a phone call from the commander of 3rd Corps, who suggested to go straight into Bastogne, instead of widening the corridor by attacking Cibre, a village to the southwest. This was a plan that Patton could have invented himself, so immediately approved of it. Lieutenant Colonel Creighton Abrams, commanding the 37th Tank Battalion, with his Sherman named Thunderbolt, moved up. Abrams asked Captain William Dwight to lead a column of five Shermans and a half-track with infantry over the road to Assenois, the village between them and Bastogne. Artillery pounded the village, P-47s dropped napalm right before the Shermans entered the village in close formation, firing with all guns. The Germans on both sides of the road could not fire back without running the risk of friendly fire. On the other side of Assenois, some Volksgrenadiers quickly laid some telemines on the road. One of those blew up a half-track. But Dwight, who was in his tank, he jumped out, grabbed the telemines and threw them at the side of the road.
When Cocotte heard that American tanks were in Assenois, he knew the battle was over. He ordered the road to be blocked, but they were too late and he knew it. Dwight's small column, of which the front Sherman fired forward, and the following ones fired sideways, thwarted any attempt at resistance from the forest. At 16.45, a quarter to 5 p.m., just after sunset, the first Germans made contact with the 326th Battalion Airborne Engineers. In the night of the 26th to the 27th of December, troops and tanks of the 4th Armored hurried to secure the corridor and protect the column of trucks with supplies which raced into town under the cover of darkness. General Major Maxwell Taylor, the commander of the 101st Airborne, who had been in the United States, arrived the next day, the 27th of December, and took over from Brigadier General McAuliffe. The siege of Beston was over. If you are ever close to the Ardennes, try and get into the Bastogne War Museum. It's really worth a visit. So, this concludes our historical video about the Battle of Bastogne or the Siege of Bastogne, which was the major pivotal battle in the Battle of the Bulge or the Battle of the Ardennes. If you know something about the Battle of Bastogne that I didn't mention, please post it in the comments. If you have uh, some criticism, please post it in the comments. And if you have any question, well, please post them in the comments too. Okay, well, that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.